Hello, Rob Dabrowski, the editor of the Biomedical Scientist magazine here. Welcome to the latest episode of the IBMS Chat Podcast. Each installment is based on the Twitter Spaces discussions that take place on the first, or sometimes second, Wednesday of every month. In this episode, we're discussing leadership and innovation, and I'm joined by Manjinder Virk from Bioma and Sagar Masagi and Cully from Northwest London Pathology. Please remember that this episode can be used for your CPD, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining our space this month. Today, our IBMS chat will take a look at leadership in biomedical science. We will hear from Majinda Verk from Bioma and Saga Megassian Kali from Northwest London Pathology, as well as from Rob, the uh, from the biomedical scientist, um, about the award-winning work in biomedical science. Uh, Manjinda is a senior biomedical scientist. She is the founder and director of Bioma and recently won an Asian Woman of an Achievement Award for Science. Saga is the managing director at Northwest London Pathology. She recently won gold for uh, leader of the year at the UK Employee Experience Awards. Um, before I pass you on to Rob, we have a few simple housekeeping points. This space is public, meaning that anyone can listen. The session will be recorded so those who can't attend can catch up later. If you want to speak, you can click request at the bottom left-hand corner of, the sc- of your screen. Um, you can also take part by uh, tweeting us a reply. Finally, our regular IBMS, uh, our regular hashtag IBMS chat thread is still live. So if you, so if you can, you can also chat over there if you wish. Um, and with that, I will um, hand over to Rob. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, yeah, please do join in. If you've got any questions, we, we do these sessions to have some engagement. So we, we're doing them for, for you, the members. So please, if there's anything you want to say, whether it's a comment or you've got a question for one of our speakers, then please do tweet us or, or message us and we'll get that over to them. There might be a slight delay if we're caught up in the conversation, but any questions that come in will get asked to our speakers. So so please do join in. Um Right, yeah, let's get underway. Uh, Manjinda, Saya, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's incredibly appreciated. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And what what we will do, if it's okay, is because you, you, you've both kind of got different journeys, different experiences, what we're going to do is we're going to almost break it up into two separate sections where I'll, I'll speak to Manjinda first and then over to Saga and... That's how it'll work. But if either of you want to jump in and make any points, then, then then don't feel you've got to wait for me to be speaking to you in a different section. Just please do jump in whenever you want, if there's anything relevant you want to say. So, yeah, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, let's just, just as a quick recap for those who don't know, you're, you're the Managing Director of Northwest London Pathology and recently won uh, the Gold Award for Leader of the Year at the UK Employee Experience Awards, which are congratulations for that, and that, that's why you're Thank here you. tonight, Saga. So well done. I, I think also Northwest London, uh, you the, you also won another award, didn't you? Is that right? Yes, we've um, you know, th- th- thank you, uh, and and um, yeah, we we have actually had a bit of a a, a streak, I guess, of um, achieving some uh, you know great outcomes. Um, we have recently won um, for public services um, for the PPMA awards um, for our employee journey experience and our onboarding program, um, and then also we won silver for the um, employee experience um, journey as well. Um, so, and then I was very surprised with the um, leader of the year because actually it was quite an unexpected, um, un- unexpected outcome. Um, so, yeah, very pleased, and um, it, it's great for Northwest London Pathology after. Um, quite a uh, long number of years of um, you know working quite hard on on delivering a huge sort of transformation program um, and bringing services together to be recognised. I think it's um, it's been wonderful for everybody and uh, great team achievement. Yeah, certainly agree. Um, and why don't you tell us a bit about how you made that journey from, from when you first started in the profession? What, what was your kind of route into the profession? Your route through the profession? How did you get into biomedical science? Yes, yeah, so actually, I was a I was a bit of an accidental um, per- person um, into into the profession. Um, 
Um, it was really through a, um, you know, really unfortunate circumstance. You know, my mother um, was diagnosed with cancer. Um, this is, you know, um, nearly 25 years ago. Um, and I had just finished university. So I, I was sort of hanging around the hospital quite a bit um, and got to know a lot of the, the um, you know, the oncologists and, and various people that were looking after my mum coming and going and you know you you get speaking to people and and they ask you you know what are you doing what have you studied and I just finished uni um I had just actually done an applied human biology degree um and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do at that point um with all the things that were going on and there was a suggestion made by one of those oncologists that actually maybe I want to talk to um uh, one of the um leads within within um what was the DGH that I was in um, who was one of the principal biomedical scientists over there, um, just just to go and have a chat and see if there's something of interest there. So actually, it was it was really through that kind of unfortunate circumstance that I even found out that all of this, you know, activity, all this work, all of these laboratories existed because it wasn't something that I that I, that I knew about um, or I was aware of. Um, and so that's when my journey began, really, was was um, through that connection. And then, um, you know, months later, when I was able to then um, find that there was a trainee post being advertised, I applied for it. Um, and interestingly enough, I didn't actually get that role. <laughs> and um, and because I didn't have a direct um, degree, I would have needed to have done a top up. And, and it turns out the person that got it um, had had that degree Um and again, months later, another trainee post came up. Um, and, this, um, this, and because this time, I didn't have a direct um, degree. This this time in uh, histopathology. And so when I applied and, and I got that um, role, and really that's when my journey began. Um, I started as a trainee in, in histopathology um, and a colleague of mine um, who had got that previous role in cytology um, then went on to actually um, become my husband many years later. So again, oh, fate lovely. and circumstance. <laughs> you know, this is this is how life um, puts us on a journey, um, and that's how I ended up in in biomedical science. Oh, and, uh, and what's been your pro- progression through your career? So you're obviously very senior now. Yeah. So again, I, th- I think for me, it was always um, you know being really curious about what goes on in in the departments. Um, I was always looking to learn more. I w- always wanted to know how things worked, um, how the system operated as a whole. So always looking for opportunities. So, um, you know, as, uh, one, once I was uh, qualified and, and um, was able to then think about applying for senior roles, um, I absolutely took that opportunity. Um, again, it, it was really um, always being curious, always sort of asking questions, wanting to know more, um, and then sort of branching out. I was always interested in training and development. So, when I had the chance to be a training officer, I took that opportunity, went on to do um, to become a training and development manager. After that, opportunities in quality and governance and then operational management. And then through that, you know, looking at, um, you know, the wider context. So outside of my own discipline and, and sort of widening the opportunities into divisional management, general management, and then and then the journey on to um, being a managing director. So. You know, lots of lots of different roles in various parts of um, of pathology departments, um, and you know, not necessarily staying with the same organisations either. So, taking opportunities to sort of develop and evolve um, and learn, um, and always being, as I said, being curious and 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 somewhat pushy, I guess, sometimes <laughs> in in wanting to to do more. Yeah. And and as someone who's just won an award for being a leader, I mean, do you think that? That breadth and depth of experience working in different departments at different levels, different sections, is that something that's kind of played into you, your role as a leader? Does, does that make you approach things in a different way? I, I think it, it absolutely does. I, I think um, having experienced, um, you know, the various areas um, that, you know, play a critical role um, for laboratories, for biomedical scientists, for growing organisations. It really does give you a good understanding of some of the key activities that go on and some of the challenges that people will have um, and and some of the difficulties and actually some of the opportunities. So it does give you a little bit more confidence, I guess, to be able to have conversations about areas um, that you may not necessarily have had direct experience in if you had just come from a one particular discipline or one one particular pathway. So I think, yeah, it's definitely helpful. I mean, it's not the only way of doing it, but clearly I think for me it has been really useful to have that broader understanding. 
And how do you get into leadership? I mean, is, is it is it a tangible thing that you always felt yourself aiming for? Are you surprised that you're now a leader? Kind of, are there attributes that you need to have? Are there boxes you need to tick? Because it seems like such a kind of conceptual thing as opposed to a, a solid, tangible thing to be, to be a leader. What What is a leader? So I, th- I think, you know, it's it's something that you develop. Um, it's a skill that you develop over time. And, and you know, a lot of people are, are leading, but they might ne- not necessarily have a, a, a leadership um, sort of title, if you like, or they might not necessarily be seen as a as somebody who's leading. But I think there's a huge amount of activity that goes on in our laboratories um, where, you know, ultimately somebody is is supervising or leading or making a decision or or um, coming up with ideas and and innovating and all of all of the skills I guess that we gain um, throughout our journey you know, the interactions that we have, whether it's managing, you know, relationships, whether it's managing sort of stakeholders, our service users, all of those skills um, that we can hone over over the number of years that we work in the organizations that we do, I think really do develop our our capabilities um, such that we can we can think about, um, you know, what, what it means to lead. And I think, you know, there's distinction between being a manager and a leader um, I think leadership, you know, you you have to kind of put yourself aside a little bit and and just think about um, the others, um, you know, and and by others, I mean, you know, the teams, the teams that you're working with, um, the organization that you're working for, um, and, and, you know, putting putting the needs and requirements of the people, the organization at the forefront of what you're trying to achieve. So I think it can be a bit of a lonely place sometimes because, um, you are not necessarily, you know, able to, you know, say all the things that you need to say or share the feelings that you might have about certain things. Because actually, you have to be able to, um, you know, take take that um, take that approach of being able to have those conversations and and I guess you know um, showing that things can be achieved. So, and yeah, I don't think it's something that grows over time. We all have different styles. I mean, everybody has um, experienced and read and and you know seen different types of leadership and. I think you know there are probably different um, different behaviours that we all employ depending on the situation that we find ourselves in, and um, you know how we are operating and working and what we need to deliver. So, um, I, I think you know there's we're, we're thrown we're thrown into some of these opportunities, and and you know you either put your arms around it um, and learn as you go. And I don't think you know any of us ever stop learning. So it, you know just because you've got a a role that is is seen to be, um, you know, a, a leading kind of role. It doesn't mean that you know it all either, because you know it's it's you have to rely on the good people around you um, to help you navigate some of the um, some of the difficulties, the challenges, and the opportunities that come come our way. And c- can you talk us through any of those specific difficulties and, and challenges that, that you've had to overcome, and, and how you've gone about doing that? Are there any particular examples? Yes, I mean, I think at the at the beginning, um, you know, I, I would say the first time that um, I took the first MD role that I took, um, you know, there's I think, and also as a female, I think there is always um, a, a little bit of um, you know, people talk about imposter syndrome, don't they? Um, it's not so much that I don't think for me, but it was, you know, the 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 questioning of self around, well, you know, do I will I make an impact or will I? Um, be able to um, achieve the things that I'm setting out to achieve so you know those those are sort of challenges that we give ourselves you know they shouldn't really be there but what we we kind of have them and they're there and and you know we have to learn how to adapt and change around that other challenges are you know again as as you go higher up I guess the the you know there is more expectation in terms of you know it is it is you who is ultimately accountable for something and so um you know, but then you get further away from the the ground, as it were, you know, from, from the shop floor, um, which means that you have to then sort of strike a balance of trust and empowerment for, with the people that, that you have put in the various places to, to, to do the, the jobs that they're employed to do. So, and that can be a challenge because sometimes we want to revert back to what's comfortable to us um, and want to sort of get back into the nitty gritty of things, whereas actually, well, that isn't our role because we've got 
other very competent and expert individuals who are leading on those aspects and you know we need to sort of step away from it so those those can be a challenge because you kind of want to get involved in everything but you can't um and you shouldn't i think and and, and if you do i think it becomes uh, you know you make your job a lot harder um so yeah I, th- I think you know those are those are some of the things i would think about straight away and do, do, do you miss the kind of working at the bench side of things i mean there's Obviously, as you say, that but when you're in a leadership position, you you can't be doing that kind of uh, yeah the the more hands on stuff. Is is that something you miss? And and do you struggle to kind of I stay used completely to. out of that and work on a more theoretical level? Yes, I think I, I think I used to in the, in the sort of earlier time. So when when you know when I was doing training and development, I was I still had it was kind of a dual role. You know, half of my time mm-hmm. was training, half of it was in the laboratory similar when I was doing quality and governance for a while but then when you go into you know pure operational management it's you can be there to help out sometimes but you do get further away from it and at first it was again it's because it's your comfort zone right and and uh, you know you kind of want to kind of lean in lean into it a little bit sometimes especially when you know things are tough but um, I've always been quite interested in um you know the management side of things um in in terms of you know service development um you know, looking at how we how we can change things, improve things, innovate, um, so and transformation. And so, I, I'd say probably I don't miss it anymore. Um, but again, I think I know in you know I think you need to know enough about what is going on yeah. in different parts of the organisation so that um, so that you are not so far removed from it. So I guess I I, I enjoy it through <laughs> other people. <laughs> And you mentioned that there's been a lot of change at Northwest London Pathology over the last few years. Yes. And working in a senior position while all that's been going on, has that been a tough environment to manage? Has there been lots of, kind of juggling multiple kind of balls? Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> um, when when isn't um, pathology a complicated environment to to operate in, right? So um, you know, we, we're we're always we're always innovating. I think everybody is is always going through some form of change and improvement. Um, it is part and parcel of what we do as biomedical scientists and and how we run our organisations. But you know, change is always a challenge. But I, I think the way that I like to sort of um, walk through change is see it. You know, try and encourage people to see it as a as a as a time for, of opportunity rather than a, a time that needs to be sort of feared and and full of anxiety. So, of course, there's always a challenge. So, you know, our, our sort of journey for Northwest London Pathology was was very much bringing organizations together right so when you're bringing organizations together with different ways of working with different practices with different cultures um it is it is very difficult and um people find it difficult to um you know navigate um you know the day-to-day delivering what they need to do on the ground but actually thinking about the bigger picture and and uh, and yeah we're all human right so we all get comfortable with what we know and um, feel um that we can do you know and and be put our arms around um and when you're talking about something that's going to happen in the future i think it becomes it becomes very difficult so it's it's always it's always um really important i think for me to to be really open and transparent through change um and when you're leading through transformation i think you really need to to ensure that people are informed that they are um able to to be able to be part of the you know the the journey to be able to raise queries to be able to provide feedback it has to be a two-way thing because you know you can't just you can't do it to people right it has to be a journey that everybody shares together and you're delivering on a single vision together so and you know it hasn't as as you say it hasn't been without its challenges um especially as we had a pandemic thrown right in the middle of it as well you know so um but again, it's it's incredible to see how people come together, um, and and the amount of experience and expertise that exists in all of our laboratories, I think, up and down the country, is is to be commended. Um, and you know, we 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 are doers. I think, as as biomedical scientists, we get on yeah. and do and we deliver, which is great. And and in these times of kind of change and transformation, one thing that can be incredibly important is creative thinking to kind of. Not, and not just from the top, but throughout the organisation to, to drive the kind of direction of travel. I mean, when people are, are so, you know, we, we all know how, how, how busy scientists are in the lab. When, when you're so busy with the kind of the day job and just getting through everything you need to do, yes. how do you encourage creative thinking from, from your teams? 
I think you have to provide the space for people to to think creatively. So again, I've always been, I've always had cu- curiosity around what what is going on, right? And I think I've tried to encourage within our teams to also ask questions and be curious about things. So I think that is really important. I think again, as humans, um, we get comfortable around certain things, and I think being able to push people to think outside the box, um, giving them the space to you know have an open mind about things is is really important and and to really think about just because we have done things in a certain way doesn't mean that it will always have to be like that and actually allow people to try things out i think you know and allow people um you know the opportunity to to maybe even make some mistakes right so i think you have to be able to um give people the chance to say look we tried this it didn't work so we're not going to do it again you know of course as long as it's within the you know, we're thinking about safety all of the time and we're thinking about patient care and patient outcomes. But when it comes to about changing, you know, the way that we, I don't know, organize ourselves or or if it's um, how we're going to deliver something or from where we're going to deliver it. I think all of this, you know, creative thinking comes from giving people the space to think about it and bringing different teams together. Because I think sometimes we have a tendency to work in silos um Mm -hmm. or within our ologies and disciplines um i think you get a much better much better way of thinking much better sort of solution-based conversations um when you bring people from outside of specific area um to to look at a problem or to help solution it together so i think all of those are um you know some some of the key things that um we really try and encourage um within our services and to create opportunities right so when we're trying to deliver um, um, whether it's projects or programs of change or, or new improvements or quality improvement, it's 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 bringing people together and maybe taking them away. So giving them the headspace from the day to day, so that you know, as you say, they're not bogged down with the day to day delivery of the service. They actually have the space to think about um, what they might want to change and how they might want to innovate. So you have to provide that because without it, I think you know, it just becomes another strain on the service and on the people and and you know it isn't fair really i can completely i remember seeing a similar thing when i was looking around the crick when it first opened and um they, they, they'd obviously got rid of all kind of barriers between different teams and yes. they purposely got it so teams were intermingling and even that they couldn't get to the coffee machine without walking past four <laughs> different teams to make sure they interacted yeah and, and they were saying that that's when kind of the magic and the great ideas happen i mean yeah. it, it is this what can spark kind of great ideas and change the kind of the interaction of teams? I think so. And I think what the Crick does really well also is that they don't keep their teams together for very long either. So not only have they removed those barriers, but there is, you know, they continuously move people around so that you're not always working with the same people, even if they are from different parts of, of um, you know, different specialties and different parts of um, the organization. And I think that's, I, th- I think that's really important, you know, um, Again, you don't want to do it too much because, you know, you, you want to give people enough time to be able to actually gel together, to come and work together, to be able to come up with, with creative ways of doing things. But I think it's really important to um, to bring ideas. And again, one of the beauties of, um, um, you know, our, our services, again, up and down the country, is that actually we're so diverse, right? People are coming from all, um, you know, backgrounds, um, different experiences, um, you know different countries where they've worked in laboratories as well and again you know there's so much learning and so much expertise that can be tapped into um, and if we don't do it you know we're really missing out we're really missing out and and um, it's you know we don't want it to be all of all the same people raising um, suggestions and ideas we want it to be from from all parts of the organization and it doesn't have to be all from people who are qualified by medical scientists. Again, we have a huge plethora of, of roles within our laboratories with people doing some great things, a lot of backgrounds, a lot of expertise and a lot of um, different sort of, um, um, you know, educational um, um, sort of qualifications, if you like. So it's it's great to be able to tap into all of that, um, as well as the different age groups that we've got, right? So it's just it's just amazing the, the, the variety that we've got um, and we really need to use it and use it well uh, it sounds like you've got a very dynamic kind of uh, involved workforce which is fantastic how how do you get how do you get new employees to understand that culture and the it, it sounds like there's a fair bit of kind of creative freedom where, when they first arrive at the organization and, and what could other people do with their organizations as well to help embed 
new employees down into the culture. Yeah, and I and I think that's you know that that's one of the the key things that we focused on over the last couple of years. So you know, coming out of our transformation program, um, which was really you know deliver delivering a specific way of working and you know di- bringing people together um, and trying to embed a culture. Um, what we um, identified, you know, with within within my team was that actually what we want is for people to understand what it is that they're coming into. So actually, one of the awards that we have won as an organisation was our induction and onboarding program, which really is a week long program whereby um, all all colleagues who are joining the organisation or have been promoted into new roles go through this process of really you know, understanding what is it, you know, who are we, where have we come from, you know, what are we constructed um, by, um, what are our key sort of um, values and behaviours and all of those things um, through, you know, fully, fully embedded. We think about our customers, we we focus on um, some of the key skills that we need to have and actually buddying people up within within, um, within the organisation. You know, we, we operate across seven hospital sites. So again, it's it's great for people to, to know people outside of their own location that they might be primarily based in. So it's it's really important, I think, for us to to really bed in those values um, right from the outset, you know, to to actually, again, um, highlight the fact that um, just because somebody might have a different role or that they, they might be, you know, the, the perceived sort of hierarchy that we have in our organisations as well, you know, everybody's equal. So there is no bad idea. Um, we really hammer that home that actually ev- all of us in any kind of management role, um, and especially our exec team, it's a very much an open door policy. Um, drop us a line, come and have a conversation. Um, and, you know, again, I'm grateful for some of the fantastic people that we've got in the organization. So, you know, um, practice educators, training and development manager, um, we've got great communications um, people, um, really great, um, obviously, scientists and, and laboratory biomedical scientists who are engaged in in sharing and, and do helping with the onboarding program that we have um, implemented. So, you know, it's it's a huge team effort, and and I think again, it's taken it take, it's taken a while to to bed all of that in, and actually, you know, rewarding people, having opportunities for people to celebrate their successes, be it through awards or um, you know, we've introduced a um, a values based um, um, sort of badge, if you like, and and a thank you sort of process whereby. You know, we've called it Living Our Values Awards, right? So we've got four values, which which we, you know, all stand behind, which is being expert, collaborative, caring and patient focused in Northwest London pathology. And, you know, we have recognition schemes for each of these. And and it's not for a manager to identify and, and celebrate someone's, um, you know, um, the way that they have lived the values. It's actually peer to peer and it can be for anybody. So you've got to encourage that and at the same time empower people to challenge the bad behaviors right and and again you know it's not, nothing is ever perfect and we're all humans and um, we all have tough days uh, but we have to work on it um to to bed that culture in so um yeah I, i'm i'm really pleased um to where we've got to and you know really looking forward to what the next few years will bring because there's some fantastic work um that many people within the service have been have been delivering um such that you know we've dramatically changed how we onboard our people, how we retain our people, how we grow our people, um, and and how we hopefully will retain them in in the service um, for longer periods of time than had been experienced previously. Perfect. That's a really good, solid, progressive ethos. Um, I think that's great, and it's a, a good moment for me to bring Manjinda into the conversation as well. Let's see. Hopefully, that mic is working now, Manjinda. Yes, I'm hoping so. Yes, there we go. I, I can hear you perfectly. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And um, do, do you want to talk us a, a little bit through your journey, Manjinda, and, and kind of how you got into biomedical science and how you worked your way up through to the position you're in currently? Right. So I actually began my journey at King's College Hospital in the virology department as a medical laboratory assistant, as a temp, um, in data entry, actually. And I remember being there and thinking, you know, post just before I had graduated biomedical sciences is, you know, what kind of environment is this? Actually putting your education into experience in that kind of setting is very quite surreal. And it was interesting watching all the scientists running around doing different things um, as an observer. 
and progressively I worked my way up within the organisation. So I became a senior assistant technical officer. I rotated in various sections. I shadowed other biomedical sciences scientists. Sorry, um, I did some clinical trial work, and eventually, after securing a trainee biomedical scientist post, uh, which I had to wait for for five years to be available within the department, I um, became a biomedical scientist. And then I started doing some on-call work, so for the NHSBT, which is the organ transplant contract, Mm -hmm. which was such an amazing experience, but it really teaches you resilience and workload management and the importance of why biomedical scientists are necessary and why we do what we do. And after that, I decided that there were gaps within not just my knowledge, but within the, the... NHS, which I could identify in terms of quality and um, IT infrastructure and just general operational management. We're very good at embedding systems and then making sure those systems run properly. But when it comes to bringing in new systems, there's an entire it's disjointed process. So my <laughs> I self-motivated myself to do my master's in computer science and my MBA at the same time as working full time. Oof. Uh, must have been very busy. <laughs> and doing the on-call contract at the same time. But um, if I always say to people, if I can do it, anyone else can do it too. And it worked out quite well for me. So I, uh, a few years as a, well, quite a few years as a biomedical scientist, making sure I learned the ropes. And then the operations manager post became available within King's College Hospital within virology, which is the chief biomedical scientist post. Mm-hmm. And I uh, managed to secure that. So... Um, I became the operations manager for King's College Hospital within virology. So all of a sudden I was managing many, many (laughs) scientists, medical laboratory assistants, and that was amazing for a few years. And then unfortunately the COVID pandemic hit and King's College Hospital helped inform the um, diagnostics pathway for the lighthouse centres and the large laboratories that were setting up COVID testing. Uh So, yeah, I became the lead for that, and uh, we led in care home testing for COVID. I remember sitting in the lab and stuffing swabs into specimen bags and unpacking thousands of samples. It it was a 24-7 job. And, yeah, after that, I went to European's Clinical Diagnostics, set up their clinical testing pathway for the UK. I worked for the DHSC, helped set up the mega lab in Leamington Spa, um, and then I raised some angel investment and set up my own clinic labs. We call them clinic labs because they're phlebotomy centres with laboratories attached. So we have our own on-site laboratories within classy units. I currently have three in the UK. And we have just signed a massive joint venture, which means we will be able to create a privately, um, it's private at the moment, but we're looking for tendering for NHS post um, contracts, but it would be the most accessible, sustainable diagnostics framework, which is here to support the NHS. Incredible. Um, you, you're making my CV look incredibly thin and spindly here, Manjin. I mean, what's, you, you, you've worked across kind of lots of different areas of, of the NHS and private and within lots of different disciplines. Can, what, what has driven this? Is it a need for understanding? Is it a need for kind of self-betterment? Is it ambition? It's patience. So I started my own venture, you could call it, because I was in A&E with my mum and um, she was unfortunately diagnosed with a blood clot and antiphospholipid lipid syndrome. And we're sitting there and we're waiting for five hours for one blood test result. And in that space of time, I unfortunately saw horrific things and I knew it wasn't necessary for her. Once she had already been diagnosed, we just needed to go home. Mm-hmm. And I was, I, I saw the pressure the NHS was under. It's almost like I've been working to perform a massive gap analysis and using skills and things that I've seen, different working environments, different ways in which people in those environments approach things and just learning for it. And it's become like a massive lesson learned um, project for myself. So what motivates me is, can I help this person? And I really believe I can. And how can I help them? I've got an amazing team. And they come with me from Kings to Eurofins to wherever I go, they come with me. And mm-hmm. they're like family. And, you know, together as a collective, we've helped a lot of people. We do everything in eye clinics from multivitamin screening to dendritic cell therapy for cancer. So, yeah, it's a, you could call it a personal ambition. Hmm. And, and, 
How well, how do you have the loyalty of that team? How, how how do you keep that team loyal to kind of follow you around between different workplaces? <laughs> So uh, during COVID, I was infamous for training. Uh, you know, when everyone was told they were non-essential, there were people told they were non-essential. Mm-hmm. I don't believe anyone's non-essential. I was, uh, so I took people, like Uber drivers, and I trained them to become medical laboratory assistants. Um, I sat there at the airflow cabinet and training them how to pipette. And I spent hours and days and days doing that. And I remember people behind me and standing there saying, these people won't be able to do it. And I was like, just watch me. And these people are now medical laboratory assistants, quite senior within King's College Hospital, because I believe everyone could do anything as long as they're given the access, the training and the support. So that's what I did with my team. Some of the guys have been working with me. Some of them were actually my seniors before I became the operations manager. Some of them are clinicians from King's College Hospital. Uh, Others are people that I gave their first opportunity for them to work in the laboratory space, in the medical laboratory space. And they've really proved themselves to have the same motivations as me. And they're able to communicate really, really effectively. And I think that's why we just get along so well. And when we bring new people into the team, we're so open because we honestly believe anyone can do anything. They just need a bit of help and support. I mean, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm seeing so many similarities between our two speakers tonight who are both so involved in leadership and innovation. And um, I mean, what what are some of the challenges you faced, Manjinder? Because... You've achieved so much, but it, it cannot have been a walk in the park because you've come out from so many different angles. What have been your challenges and how do, how do you cope with challenges and pressure? So some of the major challenges have been some of the stuff I've wanted to do, no one's done before. Mm-hmm. So there's no framework to follow. It's kind of going in and in the dark, but it's also having some faith and having some respect in the fact that you can ask people for help if you need it. Um. Some of the challenges have been, um, okay, there's only enough hours in the day. So for, for an offshoot from, you know, Bioma, which is my clinics and laboratories, I'm also a data scientist. So I have a lot of computer science um, education experience. And I really like AI and I really like the clinical applications of AI. But I also know there's a big information governance piece that goes with it. So it's about organisation. It's about having the right support. And it's about, you know, just keep yourself motivated. I think that's been a challenge. It's a bit, you want to do everything, but you really have to keep focus. And I think one of the interesting things about your career journey has been your your move between public and private sectors. Do you think this has given you um, a a, a different outlook to your kind of typical biomedical scientist? Even if, and I suppose, do you see yourself as a biomedical scientist or something kind of wider than that? I always introduce myself as a biomedical scientist because I'm always on the bench because it feels like home. (laughs) So (laughs) I don't believe I can, I can't manage effectively if I can't do the process. And I really um, enjoy being able to learn the ins and outs of whatever I'm doing and then being able to find a new way to improve it. So I describe myself as a biomedical scientist because I think all biomedical scientists inherently do the same thing. We apply whatever we do on the bench the you know working methodically standard operating procedures having quality controls those kind of frameworks are always in our minds when we're doing other things as well even if we're managing things or if we're looking to innovate if we're looking to you know come up with a new algorithm for a large language model for ai we're always doing we're using the same skill set so i i always start by introducing myself as a biomedical scientist brilliant and um the, the, the other section of that question was that you've moved between the kind of public and private right. sectors a bit. Has that given you a kind of a unique or, or a different outlook to the typical biomedical scientist, do you think? I think it has, because it's taught me that um, even though the basics of what we're trying to do in both you know, private and public are the same, we're trying to serve the patients, the approaches are very different. There's obviously um, less budgetary constraints in um, the private organisations. Mm -hmm. When it comes to expenditure on new equipment, sometimes the processes are faster because there is not a number of people that the decision-making process is much quicker. But then you'll also find that they sometimes don't have the established framework and the established experience of the NHS. So, you know, there could be a lot of quick decision-making, but a lot of mistakes because they don't have the experience of what's, you know, what could happen and what extra things are needed. So, um, yeah, it's, it has given me a bit more knowledge and a bit more understanding of how, as you know, an entrepreneur now, if I need to approach either market, 
I do have a bit more of an awareness on how to communicate with both. And is is it easier to be kind of fleet footed when it comes to innovation within a private sector because that there's less hurdles that than, than working with within the NHS? Is that something that you know lessons can be learnt, or due to the nature, if if, if you agree with that assumption, or due to the nature of the organisations, is that just the way it always has to be? It's not the way it always has to be, but um, within the NHS, you have the support when it comes to your deployment plan for your innovation. Mm-hmm. Because you know where it's going to go, you know it's the framework is such that you're going to build for that environment. So you know what your sales process is, you know what your price point is, you know who your customers are, and you know what you know what the need is, and you have that clinical support. When it comes to the private sector, they may they still see the NHS as the gold standard, and where you know some we've come from NHS. I always say the NHS made me. I was there for fifteen years. Um, I know, you know, we need to validate. We need to validate our new innovation against whatever's in the NHS to make sure it is comparable. It has the sensitivity, specificity required. Um, a lot of private organisations don't quite know that. So there's a lot of, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of wastage. There could be a lot, both in money and time. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of innovations that doesn't come to market. And even selling to the private market, they're not always kind of sure about it. So it. It's kind of a balance. Sometimes the NHS is faster. Sometimes private organisations are faster. It depends on what the innovation is. Mm-hmm. And and what one thing we've not mentioned, which is at, at the centre of this whole discussion, is how important is innovation within pathology? And if it is important, you know, why is it important? What, why do we need innovation? Why can't we just carry on? Innovation is important because nothing stays, I say this to everybody, nothing stays static. And we may all be the same species, but we're all built so differently. So in terms of, I say this about viruses all the time because, you know, my specialist diploma is in virology. Um, Things change. There's mutations, there's shifts. We know all this stuff is going to change. We can't keep the exact same assay, for example, for enterovirus because there might be a shift. We have to innovate. We have to make sure we validate again. We keep checking, you know, all the quality control that's required. But there's also things like... We, we can either, this is what I say to my team, we can either employ the same as we already have or we can make it better. So I think innovation is, I describe it as a way of trying to make things better. That, make, that makes perfect sense. And um, well, what have you learned since venturing into the world of entrepreneurship, Manjinda? There are not enough biomedical scientists doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's lonely, so the rest of the people on this call need to join me. Um, it's there's an, trying to explain a lot of things that you think would be obvious um, is not obvious because the field of entrepreneurship or the field of venture capital, for example, is very is amazing, but there's a lot going on there, and you really have to know your stuff when you get there. You have to explain, get ready to explain things that you think people should know, that you think they should know everything, the ins and outs of health and safety. They should know why a reagent is flammable, why, you know, something is um, can't be done or can be done. So you have to really prepare yourself to go into something almost a, a learning exercise for others. Um, I've also learned that there is an appetite and there is scope and there is a lot of opportunities for people to collaborate with you. Sometimes you, th- you know, you feel, People jump on the bandwagon very, very quickly, but there's still a process. So you always have that resilience and patience if you're going into entrepreneurship. And c- c- can we loop back a bit and talk about your time as um, I think it was a, a consultant at the Rosalind Franklin Laboratory, and this would have yeah. been um, during the during the pandemic. W- what was your role there? And because that seems like a bit of a kind of the odd angular thing that kind of sticks out of your c- career progression. Like how how did that work, and what was that role like, Mandinda? So I was uh, in a team of biomedical scientists and we were in, well, responsible for quality control for whilst they were validating the new systems to process large quantities of samples. We were there writing, we're almost embedding a quality control, a quality management system within Rosalind Frank when it came to adverse incident reporting, when it came to validation, when it came to, um, the major exercise was actually approving the validation. 
Um, it was an experience because I worked with Deloitte at the time. So this is when biomedical scientists were venturing more out of the traditional settings and doing a lot more consultancy work. Yes. And there was a lot, you know, biomedical scientists were being hired remotely to authorise results. Those kind of things were happening. The world kind of started to focus on the role of biomedical scientists and the importance of what they do. And as someone who is very interested in innovation and, and driving innovation and uh, kind of keeping one step ahead of uh, change were, were there any major lessons that, that you came out with from the pandemic I mean obviously there's a lot of stuff around remote working digital pathology but, but was there anything anything specifically for you where you thought aha here, here's a gap in in the service or need that I think we should be addressing and that I can help with the gap was a number of things. So my organisation currently, we're a training organisation in terms of CPD, but we've also applied for the Institute of Biomedical Scientists approval to help train our own scientists because there was a massive gap in registered scientists. Um, we There's a gap in the application of effective point-of-care devices, so we've done a lot of validation work for that, um, and we had deployed those in some of our smaller centres. There was a gap when it came to um, supply chain management. So this is where my new joint venture with my data company is going to be able to utilise existing infrastructure and create just-in-time um, supply chain management for healthcare. So there was there are a few different gaps that came out of it. Amazing, and we've we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm just gonna. I've got two questions for you both before we wrap up, which um, I'll, I'll go with you first, Manjinder. It's going to be the first one, which is what advice would you give someone who wanted to progress through biomedical science, who, who was listening tonight and thought, that's an inspiring journey. I want to do something similar. What should their first step be and how, sh how should they aim for that? So I would say, please just make sure you are well-rounded in your knowledge and skill set. Because as a biomedical scientist, you need to know about quality. You need to have some insight into IT. You need to have some insight into health and safety because all those things inform your job, inform your career. So um, I would say speak to someone a bit more senior within your organisation if that's where you want to progress. But, you know, your job is exciting. Being a biomedical scientist is amazing. There's so many things you can do. And um, it's not something everybody gets a chance to do. So always be excited by what you're doing and use it. You know, it's an opportunity. If you want to do clinical trial work, if you want to, there's so many roles that biomedical scientists can do. Get as much experience and as much knowledge as possible. And the final question for you, Manjinda, is what next for you? What, what, what are your plans? You've, you've got so many things going on. What, what are you going to focus on and what are you hoping for from the, from the next kind of coming few years? So within the next few weeks, we'll be announcing a massive joint venture and then we will be um, national and then following that, international plans <laughs> to expand. Yes, so amazing. Thank you. Um, Stagger, I'm, I'm going to bring you, you back in for two similar questions. Um, first off, what advice would you give someone who was inspired by your journey and wanted to progress in biomedical science? Well, first of all, I mean, listening to Manjinda, wow, <laughs> incredible, right? I mean, you know, uh -huh. if, if that's not inspiring, um, I, I don't know what is. But, but you know, I, I think I would say a similar thing um, to what I said earlier. Be curious about your environment. Ask questions. Don't always accept the status quo. Um, and I think find, you know, you need to find people that you think have um, taken the journey that you would like to take and, you know, approach them. Um, ask questions and you know maybe ask to be mentored um, if that is if that's something that you want to do. Um, I don't think we do enough of that. I think we we shy away from asking others to help us navigate some of the you know difficulties that um, you know yeah. sometimes we put in our own way. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. And finally, what what are your, what are your plans for the future, Saga? What's um, whether that's for Northwest Pathology or or, or for kind of a uh, more generally, what what was your plans over the next couple of years? Yeah, so I I, th I think you know for, for the organisation, I think is you know taking us to you know the the next phases. It's all about growth and and again bringing about 
the exciting opportunities um, with the implementation of all the tech and innovation that's that's going to really take us to the next phases of delivering diagnostic services. Um, so I think that's that's very exciting. But equally, I think I'm very excited about being able to, um, you know, generate the excitement um, within within our workforce um, for the next generation of people that are that are going to be going through through our laboratories, you know, across the country. So I think that would be quite exciting. I don't know if there's anything else for me personally. I think I want to do more of the same, <laughs> mm-hmm. do more of the same. Um, um, I, I think, I don't know, I, I like to say I've, I've, I don't want to do any more um, academic stuff. Um, I said that every time, but then I ended up, you know, doing the doing an MBA and doing a doctorate and all of those things. So maybe never say never, but... Um, but I think, yeah, continue to learn and evolve and, and you know, le- learn from fantastic people like Manjinder and others, um, you know, who are really pushing boundaries and doing different things. So, yeah, continue to learn. We're, we're on a journey, right? Always. So never, never stop learning. Well, what a perfect moment to, to draw things to a close. Thank you so much both for, for coming to speak to us tonight. And um, you, you've both got some incredibly inspiring, motivational stories. And, yeah. I'm sure everyone tonight has gone away with something to inspire them and to make them think differently and act differently because you've got such innovative ideas and such unique approaches to leadership that, um, yeah, I'm sure you'll have inspired a lot of people. So thank you so much. And um, Thank you. Thank you. I think we've, we've been very thin on the ground on questions tonight. We've not had any questions, but I think that is because the content was so fantastic. But if anyone does end up after this session thinking... I wish I'd asked that. I'd really like to know that. Then just get in touch with me and um, I will get, I'll get your questions answered. And I'll also be bothering Saga and Manjinda to, to get involved in the magazine because they've got some incredible things to say. But um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you to our speakers. And hopefully see you all again on the first Wednesday of next month for another IBMS chat. But for now, thank you, thank you so much, Saga and Manjinda. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please visit the podcasts page on the IBMS website for all previous instalments. And if you'd like to listen live while we record, then please keep an eye on the IBMS social media feeds at the start of the month for details about the next IBMS chat, which will be recorded live on Twitter Spaces at 8pm on either the first or the second Wednesday of the month. Thanks again for listening.